Hi everyone, uh, let me talk about why I joined the Buddhist community Rishio Kosekai. Well, the answer is pretty simple. I joined because it gives me a strong sense of connection with people. So they say that all of their teachings and practices are based on basic Buddhist ideas like the impermanence of all things, Four Noble Truths and so on, and the Buddhist script, scripture called the Threefold Lotus Sutra, which is a very interesting uh, story between Buddha Shakyamuni and his disciples exchange. Well, my family is now uh, talking from you know. Anyway, so they have community centers across the globe and you can probably find your nearest Dharma center or communities uh, on the final pages of their monthly magazine called The Living the Lotus that I put the link below. Well, but actually during the pandemic, so uh, I guess they all Almost all the seminars and exchange and meetings are going, going online. So you can probably find a way to join remotely even. Anyway, how did Richard Kosaka help me feel a strong sense of connection with people? Let me take out some notes here. Yes, uh, right. So, well, you go into Sunday service, for instance, and you will immediately find yourself being welcomed by members and they care about your goals, feelings, and uh, your life situations. And then you, can also, you will also start caring about them as well. So this abundance of interpersonal care within Richard Kosiga communities creates a strong sense of bonds with one another. So this care is something very important to me and helped me to feel staying connected with one another, especially if it's very powerfully helpful and supportive during this time of pandemic for me. So I found uh, what they're doing great was not only, however, learning the Buddhist teachings, but also sharing and exchanging each other's story of Buddhist practice in their everyday life. So to understand the significance of this practice, of that practice, I, I guess I, I should digress a bit and talk briefly about what Buddhism cared about from its day one. So Buddhism cared about people's suffering and promoted the end of suffering. That's what Buddhism is all about. And the definition of suffering uh, in, is basically like unsatisfactoriness or dissatisfaction of all experience. Let me say more about that. So more specifically, um, the tradition teaches that life is suffering, right? So meaning that no experience gives you a lasting satisfaction. So it basically says, Let's be aware of the nature of our experience. And with that awareness, let us be mindful about each moment of our life. So for instance, you got a dream job, let's say, that gives you a satisfying impression, right? But once you start working there, you will inevitably encounter with people whom you don't like and your job sometimes involves something you don't wanna do because you see doing that as meaningless, but your supervisor told you to do so. So what should you do? Well. And you don't want to be fired so you just keep accepting that and what is told and do the job so no satisfaction endures right that's the point so by definition then satisfaction is always momentary satisfaction that's the only possible way for the satisfaction to be right so in that sense satisfaction is always powerless and cannot endure so this is a fundamental buddhist idea of impermanence of all experience. So with that, Buddhism showed me how true this is for everybody's experience, including myself. But paradoxically, it also taught me that awareness of the universal unsatisfactoriness is actually a satisfying thing. So because this awareness leads to a further awareness that shows that how inescapable it is as soon as you ex experience satisfaction of your desire, in the next moment, you always encounter with the sense of unsatisfactoriness. So that's how you cannot, that's why you cannot help but to strive for further satisfaction. It's like a loop. So because your desire for satisfaction is blocked and then gets frustrated, right? So you seek a way of satisfying your desire because you cannot bear the discomfort of keeping that frustration of your desire with you. So by satisfying desire, you wanna get rid of that discomfort. So what is at stake then is whether you feel comf comfortable or uncomfortable. 
comfort or discomfort, right? That seems to be at stake. So favoring comfort over discomfort. You desire satisfaction. So that's what Buddhism taught me. This is a pretty interesting insight for the, about the nature of our life experience. And I was completely not aware of this kind of analysis of desire before my encounter with Buddhism. So this is what Buddha realized, however, 2,500 years ago. Wow, right? So life is full of frustration. So what does that leave us with? That's a practical question we need to ask because we've got to survive and continue living in the midst of that kind of universality of all suffering. Suffering in the sense of unsatisfactoriness of all, of all moments of our experience, right? So our experience is unsatisfying in a sense that satisfaction cannot endure, but always must change. That's what we learned now, uh, discuss it now. And the moment of dissatisfaction is everywhere. Is this good or bad? If you ask many other Buddhists, uh, they may have their own answers. But if you ask me, this is a good news. But it's actually not just good news, but it's a great news. Why? Well, because Buddhist insight doesn't stop the analysis of desire there. After showing that analysis about the reality of our experience, it also offers concrete paths we can practice and take in our everyday life. So it, you know, in other words, further helps me think about what to do with and how to cope with this universally shared experience of unsatisfactoriness. Then I learned an importance of accepting my reality that is ultimately beyond my control. So Buddhism has taught me how to live my life willfully by way of fully accepting the nature of our experience. That's the reality about our world. So in this sense, to me, Buddhism promotes a pretty strong world affirming living style, let's say, right? It doesn't say like, because nothing is satisfying ultimately, let's be indifferent about, to any experience. Let's just forget about the, uh, you know, the satisf satisfaction. But rather, it twists the turn for me. Given this, uh, how to say, sort of the uh, irresolvable nature of the unsatisfactoriness of all of our experience, Let's be aware of the, how inescapable that is, how universal that is, then there will be actually, in fact, no exit of that universal structure of the unsatisfactoriness of your desire. Given that, what should you, what can we do? Well, there's only a way to cope with that. That is to accept the reality and start from there. Suffering occurs, Always that uh, frustrating, frustration comes in our life. Uh, nothing's per permanently satisfying. That's, a, that's how our reality is. So let's face that, don't escape. Let's encounter and let's work on that issue. That becomes your story of Buddhism. That becomes your story of the Lotus Sutra. To me, the Lotus Sutra seems to be inviting the, all the readers to create your own story of the Lotus Sutra in that sense, but that's gonna be probably spoken uh, in, an, uh, in future videos. Well, anyways, enough for the digression. Now, let's come back to the Richard Kosekai's story sharing practice. So given the universal unsatisfactoriness of our experience, it is not surprising to find that stories told and exchanged in their meetings oftentimes start with their personal struggles like my per partner lost job. I right, some say, and let's say, I want to improve my relationship with my supervisor in the workplace. Others say, I feel as if I have like a three kids in my house, my daughter, my son, and my husband. My exams for school are upcoming and I'm so nervous and can't, can't sleep well recently. I'm feeling depressed because of pandemic. Well, some of these struggles may resonate with your feelings as well, perhaps. Um, and, but in the stories shared in Risha Kosekai, 
So these struggles are just an opening part of their stories. So their stories also contain how they are trying to cope with these struggles based on inspirations from Buddhism and the Lotus Sutra and the practical Buddhist tips circulating among Risha Kosekai members. So hearing and telling stories have been very inspiring and transformed me in many ways, especially when I, uh, how I can, uh, how do you say, like prioritize the perspective of the other rather than mine. So that's a self-centered practical application of the Buddhist idea of no self. And also when I listen to somebody in a workplace, in the family or strangers, that really improves my uh, healthy, you know, uh, human relationship in many aspects. So, you know, these stories are very powerful to hear and to hear and tell. So in Rishi Kosekai, their service is structured a little bit differently from a traditional one, like traditional, like hearing someone's sermon, singing together and uh, do some reading together and going home afterwards, right? So, and this traditional style works for many people. And I find that useful as well. But in Rishi Kosekai, uh, with its uniqueness in mind, they have their own style of service and make everybody's participation a centerpiece of their like, gathering. So you as a storyteller and a compassionate listener of that story at the same time during the service is a great contribution that builds a strong community of Risha Kosekai. Well, this is sort of the uh, uh, outline of what I want to say. So in the next video, I will talk more about how more concretely my participation and Buddhist practice in Risha Kosekai for over the last many years has tremendously improved my way of relating to people in my life and myself. Thank you for watching. See you next time.